Come in here and uh, I'm going to just start talking. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I want to thank the Wazas for opening up their home to us. And uh, thank you all for being here. I'm going to put this down. See if I can project. A guy named Søren Kierkegaard, he is a Dutch philosopher. Um, very famous 19th century Dutch philosopher. Also a Christian theologian. Very famous for it said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. And I feel like that's real important as we're starting this capital campaign. As we're looking forward as to where we're going to go, I think we need to take a look back and see where we've been. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm not a very good speaker or giving speeches, but I'm going to tell a story tonight. I feel like I'm probably a better storyteller. In the late 1820s, the federal government had formed some treaties with the Choctaw Indians and, and found this, or got this land out of the Southwest River Basin. And you can see there's no lines on here that show Mississippi, but this would be about central Mississippi right here that they acquired from the Choctaw Indians. And what they did was they, they told the state legislature that they could have two sections of this land to build a state capital on. And so the legislature sent out, sent out surveyors and people who were experts in land to figure out where they should plan a city. And they found this high ground along the River of Pearl, known as Lafleur's Bluff. And they said this would make an excellent site for a state capital. And so Jackson was born. Now, not many people were in this section except for obviously the Indians. But the South Carolinians heard about this land opening. They, they realized it was rich in agriculture. So a lot of people started migrating over. In 1832, there was a major migration of people from South Carolina to Mississippi. And I'd like to think that my ancestors were part of that. My grandmother, when she tells me the history, she pulls out this book, and in the cover of the book, it's a picture like this, and it's got footsteps from South Carolina to Mississippi. There was the, uh, a family by the name of the Holloways, Lewis Holloway and Sarah Holloway, affectionately known as Aunt Sarah to the congregation, but the Holloways were among this um, immigrant pool that came from South Carolina. Uh, Lewis was very, he was a very fluent speaker, uh, but he was also a Latin and Greek scholar. And when they got here, they were Baptist, and there was no real place for people to meet and talk. The, le the state legislature had opened up the state house to allow it for re religious groups to gather. And so he started speaking in the state house downtown, and slowly Jackson grew, and, and Baptist started trickling into the town. And his wife decided, or they both decided, we need, we need to start a church. So his wife... Aunt Sarah and some of her friends said, well, maybe we'll have a fair or a carnival and we'll raise the money. Lewis didn't really think that that was a becoming way, I guess, to raise money for a church. He, I guess he thought there'd be more perhaps religious ways or faith-based ways to do, go about that. Nevertheless, Aunt Sarah prevailed and her and her friends had a fair and raised money. They actually raised 800, there is $800, only needed $500 uh, to purchase our first plot of land downtown where our first building would be built. And over the course of seven years, Aunt Sarah continued to have fairs and capital campaigns and raise money for our first church, which you can see here. Now, this building was completed in 1843. Uh, it was built very well. It still stands today. It's been an apartment building. It's been um, an insurance company, and now I believe it's Galloway. So <clears throat> that was our first church house. Uh, we started off, we had... Let's see, in 1845, we had 55 members. It's actually five white members. <clears throat> Fifty African-American slaves met separately in the basement, had their own preacher. Now, not many people know that. From 1845 to 1860, the church would go through five pastors. So we're averaging about a pastor every three years. And so we think about the transition that they went through and what they were perhaps thinking. And, we, and, I, and I think about Dr. Pollard retiring in 2002 and here we are, staring down the barrel of 15 years, uh, going through transition. And we haven't had five pastors, but it certainly seems like we've had five, right? <laughs> With the interims, um, and some of the lengthy time we had the interims. But the church membership, despite that, grew from 1845 to 1860. went from 55 members to 331 members. Again, of his 331, 217 were African-American slaves that had a separate pastor met in the basement. And actually, after the Civil War, went out and formed their own church called New Helm Baptist Church, which actually still exists today. So um, they are part of the fabric of our church. I thought that's an interesting point. Um, 
And then we have 1860s uh, upon us. And does anybody know what happened in May of 1863 in Jackson? So this guy came to town. William Tecumseh Sherman, devout Catholic, believed in uh, total war, uh, breaking our spirit, burned a lot of our houses, um, a lot of our architecture, um, came to Jackson, sacked Jackson in May of 1863. At that time, our building was being used by the Confederates as a hospital. And so when they took over Jackson, they used it as a hospital. And it's probably the only reason why our building's still standing. But during the war, the building was shelled. It was left pastureless and in financial ruin. And the members were very scattered. Despite that, the members that stuck around pulled together and supported an initiative called the Soldier's Bible. And they put a soldier in every hand of every Civil War or every Civil War soldier that came through that building, they gave him a Bible. I thought that was very interesting and showed a lot of faith. <clears throat> Following this, the church would recover under a fellow by the name of J.A. Hackett. Now, J.A. Hackett had very little theologic training. He, was, he entered the Confederates as, Confederacy as a, as a private, and when the war ended, he came out as a chaplain. And, and he says he you know, didn't go to any sort of a seminary, and he's quoted to have said he had no books but the Bible, no preacher but the Master himself. No stimulating model except the great Galilean preacher. And under him, the church will recover to 78 members and will restart Sunday school. And then we got blessed by a very interesting man by the name of Henry Sproles. Sproles came to us in 1880. Sproles was born and grew up in Holmes County, north of us. He came from a very affluent family. They were, had a horse farm. And he grew up around horses, and at a young age, he was very good at predicting horses, and he could go to like a horse show or a horse auction, and he could look and tell you what kind of talent a particular horse would have that was coming down the pipe, such that people from all over the South started asking him to help them find a horse. And so he would go to these auctions with people as somewhat of a counselor with regards to horses. I call him the horse whisperer. So that's kind of what he was. But he got an interesting story. So after that, he got drafted into the Confederacy, and they put him down on the Mobile Bay, and they told him to guard the Mobile Bay. And him and another uh, soldier were under a canoe, and they were watching the Union. They were out in these battle boats. And, and he says he was under the canoe, and it was dark, and he had this vision from God that he needed to go preach the gospel to the nations. And he said it was a very vivid, vivid um, calling. They lifted up the canoe because they were watching the Union soldiers, and by the time a mini ball came through the canoe, hit him in the top of the mouth, and went through and lodged into his shoulder. They fished him out of the water, put him on a train. He couldn't talk. He could hardly breathe. And he says that he overheard the doctors um, saying, this one over here is going to die. <clears throat> so they put him on the train, and they shipped him back to Mississippi. And instead of putting him in the hospital, they sent him back to the family farm. And instead of dying, he actually started healing. And his wounds in his mouth healed. He regained his ability to talk. And he started telling the parishioners in the area of his part of his church his vision. And they had a capital campaign of their own and sent him to go to seminary in South Carolina. And then he came back and he would be preaching in Holmes County, ended up becoming a part of Carrollton Baptist Church, and that's where we got him. Sproles was a visionary. Um, he very much was in favor of women having a very large part in the church at that time, which was unusual. And, but under him, in 1888, the Women's Missionary Union would start. WMU started under his leadership in 1888. <laughs> that same year, this, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention would start the Lottie Moon Offering, and our church was a charter member giver to the Lottie, Lottie Moon Offering. In 1895, the Southern Baptist Convention would start the Annie Armstrong Offering, and again, our church is a charter member donating to the Annie Armstrong offering for home missions. He would also start a capital campaign. He realized we need to raise $25,000 because at that time this church that we're meeting in is, is nowhere near big enough. Uh, the church had grown under, under his leadership. And in 1894, the second building of First Baptist Jackson was built. And this is it here. And I wish it still stand because the architecture I think is so uh, beautiful. Uh, this church would hold 650 members in the great auditorium and had three Sunday schools. And that was our second church. So then we go from church membership group precipitously from 360 to 
to 973 in 1899 when he left. I'm sorry, I misspoke. From 360 to 973, from 1899 to 1917, church membership would grow under two pastors, Yarbrough and Borum. And then in 1918, we reached what is known in our history as the golden age of First Baptist Jackson with a guy named Hewitt. Okay, W.A. Hewitt. Does anybody know him in this room? Robert Hederman told me he was baptized by Pastor Hewitt. And then uh, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Shemp at the last uh, meeting said he was baptized by Pastor Hewitt. So. I need to correct that. I knew him, but I was actually baptized by Dr. Hudgens. Dr. Hudgens oh, really? came right at the tail end, and so I missed him just okay. a few weeks. Oh, well. twice. <laughs> you get baptized twice. <laughs> um, talk about a visionary, uh, Mr. Hewitt. He immediately saw, we're sitting at a church membership of 973. We've got a church house here that the Great Auditorium would hold 650. And he says, we, we need a new building. And about that time, the state legislature had moved the old capitol to the new capitol on President Street. And he told the building committee that we should go get that McDowell property right across the street. And we should build a church there. And, um, and we should be the Beacon Church for Mississippi. Now, they took that to the congregation, the congregation voted 168 to 92 to move to the site, and I thought that was interesting because I thought every vote was unanimous in the church. <laughs> <laughs> um, Levana tells me it's actually not. It's not. It's not. But we purchased that property for $38,000. The church had to decide between a Gothic-style architecture or a classical-style architecture. The Gothic style was around 327000 and the classical is 298,000. And the church again voted non unanimously, 142 <laughs> to 135 for the Gothic style. But uh, pretty overwhelming, everyone wanted the Gothic style. And that's what you'll see with our style here. We've got the hip buttresses and the pointed arch, and that's all very characteristic of the Gothic style. Uh, architect was out of New York. Um, this is a, a very interesting uh, point and, and, and draws a lot to Hewitt's faith and his vision. He recommended to the building committee that we get started building the church immediately. And I believe Robert's grandfather was, he wasn't, TM wasn't real big on that because he thought maybe we should have the money. But then after Hewitt talked to him, he realized maybe we don't need to have the money. <laughs> because what Hewitt said was if we wait till we have the money to build this grand auditorium and then we build it, then we as men will take credit for it. But if we go ahead and start the building and we let God provide the funding, then God can take the credit for it. So that's what they did. And they started building that building, and there were 200000 They only had half the money, around $200,000, and they needed to raise another $200,000 because the whole structure was ended up being about four hundred. So in today's world, um, if you run kind of an analysis on that money, what $200,000 would have been in 1925, that, that would be like us starting a capital campaign, us starting with building a new church building, and we have $4 million in our pocket, and we need to raise another $4 million. And we don't have the money, but we're going to start the building anyway. So that's what they did. But Hewitt's vision was right. He was right on. Because we started the construction, and by June of 1927, we've had our first meeting in the Grand Auditorium. Church membership went from 973 in 1917 to 2,561 in 1928. So the membership grew, and we easily met the goal for the capital campaign and paid it off. From 1928 to 1946, membership would grow under Hewitt to 4,575. That's 973 members when he started, 4,575 members when he finished. So you talk about a visionary, talk about a leader, a giant in our history, indeed. This is the building committee. Uh, J.M. Hartfield was uh, head of the building committee. He tried to resign from the committee twice, and they unanimously did not take his uh, resignation. They told him he had to, he, yeah, unanimously, they told him he had to stay. And, uh, and, he, and he did. He stayed on. But it shows the hardship of the building committee and the capital campaign and probably some of the stress that he was undergoing. And um, by all accounts, a very faithful uh, leader. Uh, T.M. Hederman, which was Robert Hederman's uh, grandfather, uh, was, or grandfather's brother. Uh, was on this uh, committee. Um, J.H. Wells, somebody last night told me they were related to J.H. Wells. So this is, the, this is an old picture of the building here. Um, and then we move on to a guy named Frank Pollard. So we've got a 
very humble man with a subtle Texas, Texas draw um, that comes to be our pastor. He was a scholarship, baseball scholarship to Texas A&M. He was a, he was a Texas Aggie, he played baseball there before he decided he wanted to go into the ministry. Um, he, got his, uh, he got his doctor of theology in uh, New Orleans, and then uh, he came to us. And he was a, a very much a visionary as well, as most of you know and remember. Um, and under his leadership, our sermons and our uh, meetings and our, um, our Sunday services would be, pro would be broadcast to not only the state, but all over the world. So we were not only the beacon for Mississippi, but we were now bringing the gospel to the nations under his leadership. So we've come a long way. Uh, we've got a lot of leaders, and a lot of leaders that I, I know I didn't, I just scratched, scratched the surface of tonight. But uh, and I understand that there's probably some ambivalence towards giving towards the capital campaign, particularly with us being in such um, transition. Um, and I know there's a lot of people who aren't happy with previous decisions, some previous decisions that haven't been made, and I'll tell you I, I'm probably one of those. There's been perhaps some decisions that I didn't perhaps agree with, but I'll tell you I've never, I've never disagreed with the mission of First Baptist Jackson, and I've never questioned the mission of First Baptist Jackson, which is to be the beacon church from Mississippi and to take the gospel to our city, state, and beyond. And so... In thinking about that, um, I think about some of the fruits that our church has um, has brought on in, in, in coming years. And you think about like Mission First, okay? You think about City Church. What about Buried Treasure, Little Feet, the Chinese Ministry, and all these mission trips that we go on from Peru to Trinidad. Africa to the ends of the to the ends of the ends of the earth. This is what we do. This is the type of fruit that this building and this congregation puts out. And the Lord's not going to know us by this beautiful Gothic structure. He's not going to know us by the nice clothes that we wear when we come in and out of this building. He's going to know us by what? Fruit. By our fruit. And He says that in the Bible. He's going to, he's going to recognize you. He's going to know you by your fruit. So we need to start thinking about that with this capital campaign. And how is this capital campaign? The capital campaign itself is not going to bring fruit. The fruit's going to come from our hearts, right? But it can certainly put us in an environment that makes us produce fruit better and more efficiently. It makes us, uh, as professionals, go out from week to week and want to produce fruit and tell other people about Jesus in our ministries, in our professional careers. Uh, dynamic children's ministry that will instill God and to the, and the heart of our precious children who are bear, bear the name of Jesus Christ to not only our generation, but the generation that will come after us. And that's very important to me, because I've got young children. Rick Warren says that uh, we are products of the past, but we don't have to be prisoners of it. And R.G. Letourneau says, the question is not how much money do I give to God, but how much money do I keep to myself? Oh, that's a great quote. If you think about it, money's not ours, is it? Not our money. Luke 9.62, Jesus says, No one puts a hand to the plow and looks back. It's fit for service in the kingdom of God. So I would challenge us uh, as church members to put our hands on this plow. And this plow is First Baptist Church Jackson. And as brothers and sisters, we move this plow forward in the 21st century. Because the last old age was in 2000, or it was in 1918. If you see, we're doing a capital campaign. It's 2018. And I firmly believe that we're going to get a preacher who's going to take us in the 21st century. And I firmly believe that we're the dawning of a new golden age of this church. And I think this capital campaign is the start of that. That's all I've got. Well, thank you, Graham, very much. And we thank the Wises for opening their home again. Thank you for being here. You uh, could have been somewhere else, but you chose to be here. And you knew we were going to talk about money, and you still came. So, <laughs> so thank you. And a special thanks to Graham. You know, um, he agreed to be co-chairman. And thank goodness we have a young person that's willing to do that, someone who grew up in our church and has a passion about our church and where we should be going and what we should be doing. He's bringing kids here. He's got three here now and one more on the way. So if everybody would do that, we, we, could, we, could, kind of, we could kind of grow. Um, so thank you. Um, tonight we want to talk about where we are and where we're going.
Graham has referred a little bit to our past. He's probably shared some things that maybe not all of you remember or knew. And it causes us to remember. When we begin the formal stage of the campaign on February the 4th, and going forward, we're going to hear a good bit of discussion, I think, about Joshua, where the children of Israel, God parted the waters of the River Jordan, and they crossed on dry land into the Promised Land. And when they got there, he sent some men back and asked them to take some stones out of the bottom of the river where it was still dry and bring them to the new land and stack them up so they could be assembled to help remind the children of Israel and their future generations of the faithfulness of God and what he had done for them. And throughout the Old Testament particularly, there's many examples where that command was given to stack up stones in order to be signs of remembrance of what God has done. And so we want to remember the things that have happened in the past. When you come into the sanctuary on Sunday, February the 4th, you're going to get a stone. Everybody will. And each of the Sundays. And those stones are going to help remind us, and you'll hear more about that as we go forward. But does anybody know the pastor that was the horse trader from Carthage, Mississippi? Dr. Sproles? I don't know if he's a doctor or not. Do you know what year he started? 1880, he became our pastor. In that same year, in Alabama, a little girl was born. Her name was Helen. Her last name was Keller. She was born with sight, and she was born with hearing. But by the time she was 16 months old, she had lost both her sight and her hearing. And she went on to live a pretty remarkable life. She died at the age of 88 in 1968. And later on in her life, she was asked a question. And the question was, is there anything worse than not having your sight? And she responded and said, yes, there is something worse than not having your sight. It's not having your sight. It's having your sight and not having vision. Now, I don't know if Helen Keller was a Christian or not. I hope she was. But her statement parallels a verse in Proverbs and other verses in God's Word about having vision and going forward. And that's really kind of where we want to go. Mark Twain was a contemporary for a certain period of time with Helen Keller. They were on the same platform a number of times, knew each other, had conversations, talked about each other. And he is quoted as saying that you want to spend your time looking to the future because that's where you're going to spend the rest of your life. And so that's what we really want to focus on, really, is the future as we go forward. This is kind of built around a decision our church made on October the 29th, 2017, where we voted to go forward with a plan that had been presented a number of times to rehab some specific spaces in our, on our campus, areas that impact everyone in our church, and particularly impact the next generation, young kids and parents. It also has an outreach to the inner city by creating an early learning center at Mission First. The decision that we made on that day was congregational agreement. We agreed that this plan was the right direction for our church to go. In March of this year, 2018, we're going to need financial commitment. And I would just say that congregational agreement and financial commitment are not necessarily the same. And so the purpose of this Arise campaign, campaign is to connect those two. It's a bridge, it's a path that leads us from congregational agreement to financial commitment. And we're asking those that are attending these forward gatherings to begin the journey early. We're going to kick it off with the church a week from Sunday on February 4th, but we've had two of these already. This is the third. There's two more next week. And we're asking the people that choose to come to these gatherings if you'll begin the process early and be one of those that helps lead us across that bridge from agreement to commitment. Um, I'm going to share a story that I've never shared before. I didn't share it with the other two gatherings. And next week I'm going to be out of town and Walter's going to help. Walter Shelter's going to help Graham do this. Uh, but this is about our church. And it goes back to uh, some of the things Graham mentioned a little bit back in the late 40s and early 50s. The Southern Baptists created a radio and television committee, it was initially called, to begin using that technology to help share the gospel. It changed its name to the Radio and Television Commission. A guy named Paul Stevens was the head of it for a long period of time. And they began a radio broadcast that they called the Baptist Hour. And in 1974, they asked Frank Pollard to be the voice for the Baptist Hour. 
and he would record those sermons at our facility, and they would ship them to Fort Worth, where the headquarters for the Radio and Television Commission was located, and distribute them around to the different uh, stations that were using them. A few years later, they created a television program called At Home with the Bible, and they asked Frank in 1976 to be the person for that television broadcast. And he would leave our church periodically and go over to Fort Worth and film a series of those, and they too would be broadcast over a period of time. And so our church had a long relationship with the Radio and Television Commission, and after um, the original guy retired, I believe a man named Jack Johnson took his place. And he came to Jackson, I'm thinking around 1990. I haven't really checked the date for sure, but somewhere along in there to meet with Frank and Larry. And he said to them, there's an opening, we believe, in the former Soviet Union in Russia. And we believe there's an opportunity to put Christian broadcasting on their televisions. And we'd like to do that. And we'd like to ask Frank to be the voice and the pastor that we present to the Russian community on television. And obviously Frank and Larry were humbled and pleased and wanted to do that. The problem was that they didn't have any money at the Radio and Television Commission, or at least none that they could find that they would allow for this purpose. And they wanted us to pay for uh, the re recording of those uh, programs and the translation to a Russian language and getting the tapes over there and the TV time and all that stuff. If you remember about 1990, what was going on in the fall of 1989, in October, we had moved into our new sanctuary and began using our new facilities. And we had been through a massive capital campaign. We were still in it for such a time as this. And as the building went forward, it was known that the price was higher than what they thought it would be at the beginning. And so a lot of things in the budget had been pulled out, a lot of things in the original plans were pulled out and there just really wasn't any extra money anywhere. And most of our members were still paying on their commitments to the first such a time as this. And so they just couldn't figure out, is it appropriate to go back to the church and ask for more money? Can you put a capital campaign on top of another one? And you know, they just couldn't get to the right place. And finally they decided, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna reach out to a handful of people and just ask them if they are willing to write a check to fund this. And at the same time, one of the things that had been cut out of the original plans for the building were upgrading of our television equipment. Our television equipment now is old and out of date. It was not quite as old and out of date back then as it is today, but it was a similar set of circumstances. And so the idea was we need to replace our television equipment and we need to raise the money to be able to translate into the Russian language and do all the costs associated with it. And so somehow I got involved with Larry and Larry and I and Frank and Larry put together a list of names and we decided we were going to have about four or five, six breakfasts or lunches and invite you know, a half dozen, ten people in and give them the spill and see what they say and we decide whether we'd be able to do it or not based on their response. And I remember the first one we had was a breakfast and there was I think less than ten people, maybe nine people in there, all men. They're all deceased now. There's one lady. Uh, you would know their names if I started naming them. They were of a prior generation. They loved our church. They loved the Lord. They were men of capacity and capability. And uh, so we sat there and had breakfast. And then Larry and I kind of gave the spill. And, you know, they're the generation ahead of me. My dad's contemporaries. I'm kind of shaking in my boots. And, and um, But we finish. And like would normally happen with that group, they start asking questions. And they start probing them pushing and this, that, and the other. And we're answering them the best we can, and finally everybody leaves, and Larry and I are looking at each other and wondering, well, how did that go, or is it okay, or what do you think? And we didn't know, and I went on to work, and Larry went to the church, and about 10 o'clock that morning he called me. He says, guess what just happened? I said, I don't know. He said, Marie Swayze, she was the one lady that was in there. She had not said a single word in the meeting. She sat there the whole time and listened. He said, she just came to my office and brought me a check for $30,000. That was the amount that we were asking everyone to give. And $30,000 is a lot of money today. It was a lot more money 30 years ago. And she walked in and she said this, something to this effect. She said, Larry, you know, sometimes you just need to do the right thing. And this was the right thing to do. And I'm not concerned about the details. I know that will all be taken care of and taken care of properly. But we need to go forward with this and I want to start. 
And it didn't take long for the word to get around of what she had done. And within less than a month, we had all the money collected. Men started writing checks. And I firmly believe it's because she was willing to go first. She set the example. She got out there and said, this is what we ought to do. And so these forward gatherings that we're having, that's simply what we're asking you to do, to be the first ones to cross this bridge between agreeing that this is what we ought to do and going to the financial commitment. So that's what we want to talk about tonight as we visit with you. The uh, campaign has a number of goals. I'll just mention two of them to you tonight. One of those is that we want maximum participation from our church. So what does that mean? Do we want the most money we can get out of your wallet? No, that's not what we mean. I've learned a few things. I'm not a fundraiser. I'm not a preacher. Graham isn't a preacher. Graham's not a fundraiser, but we've talked to some folks. And I've learned that my wife and I are a giving unit, and I suspect most of you are the same. If you and your spouse give to the church together, you are one giving unit. If you give separately, you're two giving units. So we have about 1,100 giving units in our church, and so what we desire is maximum participation by those giving units. And what we're really asking them to do is just enter into a conversation with God, a serious conversation about what is He saying for this individual person to do as it's related to arise. So another goal that we have is that we need to raise $8 million. We need to do it in 24 months. And $8 million is not a number that necessarily causes us to go backwards. We have a budget that's greater than that. It's been greater than that for a number of years now. We've given the budget or given more than we've spent most every year for a long time. In addition to that, we give Lottie and Andy. So we give a number every year that's much higher than $8 million. We've had two capital campaigns in the 80s for such a time as this, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, the Vision for Life. Both of those total projects were over $22 million. So we're talking about eight. So it's a number we can digest, I think. It's a number that doesn't necessarily cause us to go backwards. But at the same time, it's not going to happen just because we say we need $8 million bucks, unless everybody is willing to decide this is what we ought to do and each person enters a conversation with God to decide, is this the right thing for me to do at this time? What should be the number? So we want to challenge you to begin thinking about that. You know, just doing these things, even though they're important areas, we're really asking young people to come to our church and bring their kids. And most of the young kids move further out today. They live further out today than they did years ago because that's where the newer subdivisions are. They have newer schools, they put their kids there, they're in neighborhoods, and their churches there, and they're good churches there. I was out, Gene and I were out a couple of nights ago up in Madison County, and Philip Thurman grew up in our church and has a church up in Madison called Caring Bridge, I think is the name of it, and um, he was in that restaurant, and then all these kids start coming in. He's got his whole youth group taking over that restaurant, restaurant that night, they're going to do a trivia, and the trick is to get the kids in his church to invite their friends to come there and want to know more about it. And so those kind of things happen in the suburbs pretty easily. We're asking parents to take their kids and leave that area and come downtown, an area they don't go to that often, in some cases, bring their kids, and then when they get there, we tell them, oh, by the way, we want to put you in spaces that are 30 years old. It's just not a really good scenario that we need to figure out how we can address and fix. So... That's what this campaign is all about. Fixing those areas, though, is not going to cause people to line up on State Street and President Street to get to our church. Those dynamics that interact with our metro area and where people live and how lives are lived and all those kind of things are not going to change just because we update these facilities. We need to update the facilities, but it's going to take things beyond physical changes in order for the things that I think we'd all love to see happen to occur. So I want to ask LaVon if he'll come and visit with us for a few minutes and just talk about some of the things that the staff is working on related to this. Yes, I will. Thank you, Paul. The uh, two, two quick kind of bridge things. I do know that church votes are not unanimous because when I came back, there were 172 people voting that, that voted against me. Some of you in this room probably, if you're the truth, so hopefully you change your mind a little bit. Secondly, uh, Paul, when we were in Russia with the choir uh, probably eight or nine years ago now, we were at a concert, and uh, a guy had traveled in about 45 miles to hear our choir because he had come to know Christ through the broadcast of Dr. Pollard in Russia. So just that continuation of that legacy and what happened. 
Uh, Graham talked a lot about the history of the church. I want to take just a minute and, and continue that story, but kind of fast forward a little bit to where I think that we might be going. And I, well, I have in my office uh, one of my favorite pictures, or, and it's a picture of Walt Disney. In the 1960s, Disney had uh, purchased all this property and had built uh, the property out in California. And they had realized right away that they were landlocked. They had no room for expansion. And so they began privately buying up property in Florida. Nobody knew they were buying it, uh, but they were buying it up to try to launch this, this enterprise that would become known as Walt Disney World. And the picture that, that I have is, is, is Disney walking through this swamp land, and they've come back and superimposed the castle where it is now because he saw something that was yet to actually have existed. And that's really what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about being able to see ahead to something that has not yet happened. Um, and for us, uh, you know, our vision as a church is really the Great Commission. That's it in a nutshell. Um, you know, pastors come in and they frame those things differently. And I believe that God's going to send a pastor that will help frame that moving forward. But sitting here tonight, our, our vision is to pursue the Great Commission with everything that we have. Um, and I have talked about vision over the years, I, 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 but I've never seen it fully laid down until I went to Lynchburg to work at Liberty University. And uh, J Jerry Falwell, I mean, if you liked him or not, uh, we started that school in 1971, and they started with 14 students. And his goal was to be the largest evangelical school in the world, basically the Notre Dame of the evangelical world. And uh, I got an update this morning, they have 117,000 students active at Liberty now. Um, and he, when he was pursuing that, he, he had what he called B-HAGS, B-H-A-G, a big, hairy, audacious goal is what he would call it. <laughs> People thought he was crazy, but, and some of you tonight may be thinking, why in the world are we doing a capital campaign with no pastor? And here's the reason. Number one, because our vision is not based on a pastor. Our vision is based on Scripture. It's based on the calling that God's given us. And that's really what compels us. Secondly, I think that all of us in this room understand that what's going to allow that vision to take place over the ensuing years is not necessarily reaching the folks of us in this room. The folks of us in this room will not be able to sustain this church moving into the next years. It's going to take reaching those young families. It's going to take reaching those children and those students. And that is where, really, this capital campaign lands. Much of what we're doing is not accomplishing a vision, but setting up a foundation for the vision to be accomplished as God brings in the, the leadership in the years ahead. Uh, Bruce is going to come in just a minute to kind of give us some fleshing out of what that might look like and why these, the, the, these spaces are so critically important. I know most of you in this room personally, and I know your heart for the Lord, and I know that you, like me, do not want to guard the caskets of tradition and history at the expense of our kids and our grandkids. And as we move forward, I really believe that he's calling us to pursue the Great Commission in the future and to set that up right now as a church as we move forward. And Bruce is going to come and flesh that out for us. Thank you, Lamont. Uh, great to be here tonight. Uh, thank you all so much for your story, uh, intersecting with my family's story. Uh, it's hard to believe that Meredith and I have been here almost 12 years uh, this coming June. And I remember my very first week at First Baptist Jackson was VBS. Uh, it was just a tremendous week. And my eyes were open uh, wide to uh, the ministry and a multi-generation ministry that we have at First Baptist Jackson. One of the things that I've loved over the years is seeing how all ages uh, disciple all ages. How we learn from children uh, and how our children learn, learn from our elders as well. Uh, in 2017, 70% uh, of our new members were under the age of 36 years old. So everyone that joined First Baptist Jackson last year, 70% of those were under the age of 36. Uh, I'm excited about what God's doing and what he's going to do. Uh, January uh, 2018 has been awesome so far. Uh, our D-Now, uh, led by Mallory McCoy and Stephen Smith, they did an awesome job. Uh, it was just a fantastic weekend. 175 students uh, were present. Uh, it was just a great group of kids. And 10 stories uh, that week of students were impacted eternally. Uh, the care that you all gave for them, your prayers, uh, the way that you invested in, in those students and in Mallory and Stephen, uh, even making brownies and desserts and hosting homes, all those things made 
an eternal difference for those students. Uh, we have upward basketball, uh, 350 kids on Saturdays uh, play basketball at First Jackson right now. We have more teams than we've ever had in the history of our upward program, and uh, we need a place to invite them back to uh, that is engaging for, for our children and for our families. So it's been awesome. Uh, little boy, I don't know if you were at church about, I think it was maybe three Sundays ago, he didn't walk down the aisle, he ran down the aisle. Uh, literally from almost the back of the sanctuary, and he sprinted down there. And I love that little guy's story. Uh, he doesn't have a dad in his life. Uh, he only has his mom and his twin brother. Um, but you all uh, fill in that gap. You're the ones in Sunday school and the ones on Wednesdays, uh, summer camps that make a difference in his life and the environment that we're inviting he and other similar stories just like his. The ones that don't have fathers, the ones that don't have role models in their life, and inviting them back to that. Uh, so I'm thankful for that. I want to share a scripture with you. Uh, it comes from Psalms 78, verses 2 through 4. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things. Things from old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, we're telling the next generation about what he has done, what he's going to do, and, and training our children up in the Lord. Uh, tomorrow night, 110 fifth and sixth graders uh, will be doing a thing called Moonlight Madness. Uh, that means that we start at 7.30 p.m. and we go until 7 a.m. And yes, we are crazy to do that a little bit. Uh, but a lot of those, uh, those 110 kids, they don't attend First Jackson. A lot of those students, those children don't have church homes and their parents don't actively attend some place. So we're excited to be able to invite them back to a place where we can tell the ultimate story, which is his story, uh, in a better way. And so that's a lot of what this is about, is equipping us to be able to take God's story and share that in a dynamic way for, with our children and with our families. Uh, when you look at a, whatever school our grandchildren go to, our children go to, a lot of that is about technology, it's about updates, it's about bright colors, and all those things that help them learn in a better way, uh, that make it fun for them, that make it engaging. Uh, a stat that's out there is 80% um, of those that return to a church return because of the environment that they interacted with. So uh, that comes into effect in all of this and the way that we inv invite people back. And so thinking of a story, uh, I know uh, from my peers that drive miles and miles to First Baptist Jackson because of you sharing your story with them and how much you all mean in discipling them. Uh, so it's just an awesome testimony to that. We're excited about what God's doing right now. Say a prayer when you're getting in bed tomorrow night uh, for, our, for our group as we uh, go to the movies, as we go uh, to a trampoline park and all those things, and as we uh, exchange stories and his story tomorrow night. Thank you, Bruce and LeVon. In uh, 1939, a young man was uh, graduated from high school in April of that year. He was in Lincoln County, rural Lincoln County, about 18 miles southeast of Brookhaven. He had lived there most of his life. He had four bears that came from South Carolina, like was discussed earlier around 1812. There had been, he was a fifth generation Mississippian, and all the four previous generations had born, been born and died basically right there in that area. And he had rarely left Lincoln County, but he decided he wanted to come to Jackson as an 18-year-old kid. And he found a boarding house on Mississippi Street down where the fairgrounds are located now. And he walked up the hill to Capitol Street, looking up and down the street for a job, and he found several as a restocking a grocery store at night, selling shoes and various things. And on Sunday, he walked up the hill to First Baptist Church. He had grown up a Baptist in Lincoln County. He had been baptized in a creek beside Pleasant Hill Baptist Church in rural Lincoln County. He said that the deacons would walk in the creek first and form a semicircle to keep the snakes away. And then they would baptize him. And uh, I don't know if they can still do that today. <laughs> so he walked up the hill and he went into First Baptist. Can you imagine a kid that had only been in rural churches in Lincoln County walking into our sanctuary in 1939 and what thoughts must have gone through his head? And so not only did he get spiritual food, but the men of the church took him under their wing and began mentoring him, not only about spiritual things, but about life and giving him opportunities and having him to ask questions and giving him direction. A year or so later, a young girl graduated from high school in Ackerman, Mississippi in 1940. 
Her father had died when she was 10 years old. He was killed in a car wreck during the Depression. He was in Oklahoma City um, trying to find work as a commercial artist. You can imagine there wasn't much of that going on during the Depression. So her older brother and her mother and she moved to Ackerman where an aunt lived who was also a widow. And she shifted around there for a while. Her mother died less than two years later from cancer. So before she was 13, she was an orphan. She lived with other relatives off and on, but graduated from Ackerman in 1940, came to Jackson, had an aunt and uncle that lived in a boarding house on Northwest Street, right across from Central High School, right around the corner from the building that uh, is part of Galloway now, that was one of our original locations. And she found her way to First Baptist. And at First Baptist was a lady named, um, my mind all of a sudden is going blank. I'll think of it in just a minute. Uh, Edith is her first name. And she was a Bible teacher. And she was widely known and highly respected. And, her, and uh, this young girl began going to her class. She had a Tuesday night Bible study. And this lady had, I believe, four children, three daughters and a son. But one of the daughters was named Carol. She wound up marrying William Waller, who became governor of Mississippi and was the mother of the Waller boys and families that are in our church. The other daughter that she had that I knew was named Joy. She married a guy named Holmes, and Joy and this girl were the same age and good friends. And this lady just took after this young girl, and the ladies in her class joined with her, and they began mentoring her. On December 7th, 1941, the war came, and the young man began going around to recruiting stations and joined the Navy a few weeks later and enlisted and began serving. And he wrote a letter back to a man named James Foster, who was in our church at that time. And James Foster had worked with the young adults, and he knew this young man. And he wrote the letter and said, I've seen this girl at the church. I've kind of been with her when we would go to Sill Lily after church, or they would go over to Burton's restaurant, which is the elite now. But I don't really know her name. I don't know how to contact her. I'm not sure she even knows me. And so can you give me a contact uh, information? So he did. And this young man wrote her a letter. And the letter said, I'm so-and-so. I've seen you at First Baptist. And I would like to meet you. And I'm in the Navy now. I'm going to be on a troop train coming through Jackson on a certain day. And we'll be at the depot on Capitol Street right across from the King Edward. And the train will arrive at about midnight and be there for about an hour. I'd love to meet you. So she read the letter. And she uh, showed it to her aunt. And her aunt read the letter. And she looked at her aunt and said, can I go? And her aunt said, no, you can't go. <laughs> Uh, they didn't let you go to the train station at midnight in the 40s, and they don't do it today either. But her aunt said, this is what we'll do, I'll go with you. And so she took her, and they met, and that began a formal relationship that resulted in an engagement toward the end of the war, and then they were married on January the 20th, 1946, and I came along three years later. And so that was the story of how this church reached out to my parents, and now a fourth generation, one of those kids is going to be in the group with Bruce tomorrow night, staying up all night. And um, I know Joe Young and his bride are back there, and I believe they have fifth, five generations in the church. And I don't know how many Robert's got, where he is, but they got a few too. And so we could go around the church and pew to pew and be story after story of how this church has interacted and mentored to younger people for generations. And it certainly has had a dramatic impact on our life. And it's something we place great value on. And I'm sure many others would say the same thing. It's part of our DNA. Uh, the same thing about missions. Uh, you heard Graham talk about how we were one of the charter members of the WMU. It's charter members of the Annie Armstrong. Charter members of Lottie Moon. And it's been that way now for uh, a long time. Who would have thought in December or a couple of weeks before the end of the year when they gave out the numbers of where we were in relationship to our goal for Lottie Moon that we would achieve it? It's hundreds of thousands of dollars away, but yet we did. Because missions is part of our DNA. Um, some of you were at the Deacon Wives Banquet, and part of that banquet was some singing done by four men that 
at one time were all part of our church. One of those that sang bass was Larry Taylor, it's Val Etheridge's uh, brother, and uh, grew up in our church and is now up in the Gluckstadt area and involved in the school up there. And they began going to the church that at one time uh, we were operating up there that's now on its own. And at the close of that uh, Deacon Wives band, before they sang their final song, he just wanted to say thank you for us, in essence, giving them that church. That church had about 20 people attending and was way in debt and was going to close its doors when our church made the decision to get engaged up there. And, and then we were able to turn it over to a new group a few years later, and it's thriving and having an impact on a lot of people. And starting churches is part of our DNA. Um, the television ministry we've been on since the mid-50s. And how many people, that's the church they go to. It's part of our DNA. And we just keep going on and on and on. Kathy had a Sunday school meeting uh, Sunday, I mean Saturday at the church. I think it was 120 people there on Saturday at noon, giving up their time to come and talk about what they could do better for Sunday school. We've had a long history of people that are prepared and gifted teachers, generation after generation. So when we think about this campaign, there's, there's two charts that we used back in the fall. Let's see if I got this one. Is that right? Yeah. This is a chart that just shows the membership of First Baptist Char Church uh, as of July last summer. And it's in a bar graph form. And each bar is a different age range. It's about 10 or 15 years in each age range. And over on the far right is where I was a long time ago. And I'm close to the far left now. And that's what happens. You just kind of move to the left as you get older. And you can see by the height of those bars, our church is an older church. The makeup of our membership, which really says that those that are coming behind us when we're not here, there's not going to be that many. And so we're really kind of at one of those crossroads, like Rand mentioned in our past, where we have to make a decision is, do we want this to play out in the direction that it's headed, or do we want to seek God's face as to where does he want us to go, and how does he want to use us in a more powerful way? We have all this stuff built into our DNA that particularly those in the tall bars know and experienced, and would we not want more to experience that and keep going forward? And to do that, it's going to take a number of things to come into play. A lot of the things that LaVon and Bruce talked about. But in order for it to begin, we've got to have the place fixed up. We've got tired old spaces that are 30 years old. One other chart I'll show you. And this chart is the number of givers. Those giving units we were talking about. There's about 1,100 on the left-hand side and about 2,000 on the right-hand side, and it's an eight-year period of time. So that's a trend chart that shows kind of what's happened to the number of givers in our church. The reality is the amount of money has stayed up there pretty close to the same, so people have been very generous in giving, but there's a lesser number of people that are giving. And if you follow this one out to the future, it doesn't take us to a place we want to be either. So we're really focusing tonight on this crossroads that we're in, and can we use the Arise campaign to begin the process of trying to change the direction of the church. And so when you leave here tonight, we want to ask you to take four things with you. Um, let me mention a couple of them that we're going to give you when you leave. One of them is this little piece of paper. It's kind of a one-pager, just a, a brief summary of the Arise campaign. And the other thing is a pledge card. And then there's two other pieces of paper. I'd like to ask them to go ahead and start passing out now that we can talk about while you hold it in your hand. While they're passing those out, if you'd like to get one, um, Sproles, for the loss of no, Sproles, um, some of you know the window on the fifth floor, the stained glass window, if you ever looked at it, that's the Sproul's window. That's the window that was moved from one of those early churches. It's been moved a couple of times. Um, and the pulpit, the one that's the shorter one, I should say, that is freestanding, that's used most of the time on the platform in our services today, is the one that Sproul's preached from 100 years ago. So 
little trivia there for you. So you've got two cards coming around. Have you got one of these? This is the one I'd like to talk about first. Here's what we want to ask you to do. This is the ask for tonight. We want to ask you to begin a process really ahead of what we're going to ask the rest of the church to do in a couple of weeks. And that process is simply to engage God, to have a time of prayer, of serious prayer, about what He lays on your heart related to the Arise campaign. And you can see on this card it says, would you start a season of prayer about what God would have you do related to Arise? And then here's some key questions that we'd like you to ask yourself as you go through this process. And one is, will you ask God to bless your decision? Throughout God's Word, we see that many, many times. And so not only do we want to ask Him to bless your decision, but also how the funds are used. Can we stretch the funds? God can stretch those funds, and we'd love for that to happen. And what will happen in these spaces where these funds are used? We ask God to bless what would happen in the lives of individuals where these funds are used and where they're deployed. The second uh, point under there, third bullet, is does your decision create in you enough spiritual enthusiasm and excitement to see it fulfilled? We would encourage you, as you go through this process, to desire to come out on the other side enthused. I mean, you're going to run into people in our church. You have your own circles of influence that you see. And we're asking the people in these four gathering meetings to be the first ones to go across the bridge. And it's going to take excitement and enthusiasm to do that. So I hope you will make that part of your prayer process also. And then finally, the most difficult question probably is, does your decision demand your best for God? Throughout God's Word, He requires of us our best. When sacrifices were made in the Old Testament, he didn't want sacrifices made with the lamb that was blemished. He wanted the unblemished lamb. He wanted the first fruits. And on and on and on with many, many examples. And so when you pray through this process, can you pray to God that your result that you want to do is your best? I think if we all can do these things, then we'll get to the point where we need to get to. The verse at the bottom says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's where we want to come out on the other side. We want to be a cheerful giver. That's a verse most of us have heard since we were little kids. And have you ever thought about why does God love a cheerful giver? A few years ago, I think in 2008, Tim Tebow was playing in a national championship game, I believe, from the University of Florida. And he put the black paint under his eyes, and he wrote on there John 3.16. And that day, there were hundreds of, actually millions of Google searches to find out what that meant. I doubt any of you had to do that. I know that verse. It's a verse that we all learned as young children. And what does it say? For God so loved the world, he what? He gave. So God gave his greatest gift. So God gave it cheerfully, and so God is a cheerful giver. And God commands us to reflect Him in the way we live our lives. So God loves a cheerful giver because a cheerful giver is reflecting what God is. And so I would just encourage each of you to think about that as you go through this decision. We're asking you to do this early, ahead of the rest of the church, and on the back of here is a save the date. And it says February the 20th. That's a Tuesday night. We're going to have a special service that night that Larry Black is going to lead. It's not going to be a long service. And we're just simply asking you to bring that pledge card that you get when you leave tonight and be a part of submitting that pledge card that night. And hopefully that will be a, a good way of demonstrating to the rest of the church, because you're going to be several weeks ahead of when they're being asked to turn in a pledge card that there's a large group of people that are enthusiastic, supportive of what we're talking about. So I would encourage you to put that on your calendar. If for some reason you want to do that and you can't come on February the 20th, Bobby Ray will take your pledge card. Okay. <laughs> it's not a problem. The other card is, we talked about earlier, getting to eight million bucks. It's just not going to happen. It's going to require some commas and zeros. We need some people that are willing to, 
to be pretty bold and step up. But I would just encourage you to look at these and see if you could find a place on there. The higher to the top, the better. But everybody's got to do what God leads them to do. And that's all we're encouraging you and asking you to do in this process. On the back of this is a, is a quote, and I'll read it. It says, in God's eyes, success is measured by significance. And significance is measured by obedience. The more we commit ourselves to God's purpose for our lives, the more we bring honor to our Lord as we advance His kingdom on earth. And the more we plant trees we'll never sit under. I'm pretty sure those men and women that mentored my mom and dad, I guess that's what, 80 or so years ago now, uh, never thought about today. They never thought about the trees that would grow in the future. They never had an opportunity to sit under the shade of those trees. And I'm sure there's many people you've influenced that you'll never see the shade from those trees. But it's part of transferring to the next generation the good news of Jesus Christ. And I think that's really what this whole thing's about, is preparing us to be in a better position to transfer the good news of Jesus Christ to the next generation. So again, the ask is for you to begin this process Hopefully you will return on the 20th and turn in your pledge card. If you can't return that night, if you could do it prior to that time and get it to Bobby, get it to the church office, then we'll be headed down that road. So, what time do we got? 8.02, so we're pretty much on time. Anybody got any questions? I want to thank you for being here. There are a couple of places... Robin wanted me to remind you, in the driveway out there where the bricks are uneven, we need no one to get hurt when they leave. So be watching as you go. Anybody else got anything? I want to thank the cooks. The that ladies who made all that delicious <laughs> Well, again, thank you for being here. Let me just close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for our time together tonight. I hope you'll bless it. I hope you'll bless each person in this room, each family that they represent, and particularly uh, bless our church as we seek to find your face, as we seek to do the things you desire us to do. Be with us now as we leave. We ask for safety and guidance and direction. These things we pray in thy name and for thy sake. Amen. Amen. Everybody stay so for the city council is her birthday today. Oh, Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Cindy. Happy birthday to you.